Hello and welcome to our very first edition of the Podium podcast. Um, many people call this a pilot. Um, this is a pilot. This is so that we can make some mistakes, uh, probably collect up some bloopers for the outtakes file, uh, but also share a little bit of what this is all about, a flavour for uh, the podcast, for the show, um, and introduce ourselves. There are two of us hosting. Um, I'm Simon Hartley. My background is sports psychology. So for the last 20 or so years, I've been working with professional football clubs, Premier League and Bundesliga, uh, Formula One, T Team GB Olympic squads, etc., helping them to get their performance right. And I'm joined by the rather wonderful Tom May. So I am Tom May. I'm a former professional rugby player. Uh, I've played over 350 games of first-class rugby, and I can feel every single one of those. I've played in the North East for Newcastle Falcons. I've moved to France to play for Toulon. Uh, I've played for Northampton Saints and I've represented England, uh, so I should know a bit about professional sport. Uh, I retired from sport in 2015, so I'm seven years out of the professional game and I have an understanding of what it takes to go through the transitional period, the, the tough side of it and the exciting, uh, excitable uh, understanding of what we're going to be moving into from a business perspective. I think the opportunities for sports people once they leave professional game are there for all to see, but it takes a bit of an understanding to get that through into your, into your, I guess, trained mind as a sports person. And we'll be exploring that as we go through this podcast. Absolutely. So what's Podium all about? From my point of view, um, I have heard so many people, hundreds, probably thousands of people over the years talking about how a sports mindset applies into business. Um, and I think it's a fantastic concept. I really do. But I'm also interested to know how a sports mindset trans uh, transitions into business and particularly how sports people, when they retire, can take their sporting performance mindset, their athletic mindset and apply that into running their own business. So during the course of this, we're going to interview some fantastic people who have made that transition to find out what does work, but also what doesn't work. Um, and we've got loads of brilliant guests lined up. Uh, so we're going to be, over the course of this year, talking to people like Olympic champion Rebecca Adlington, like England cricketer Harry Gurney, like uh, rugby league legend John Wilkin, who have all gone out and turned their athletic mindset um, and, and taken it into an entrepreneurial world. So that's what we've got lined up. Um, we've also got some, uh, along the way, some brilliant prizes, um, prizes like uh, attendance at some of the UK's top sporting events to give away. So even if you're not enjoying the chat, maybe you'll enjoy the prizes, but hopefully you'll absolutely enjoy the chat. To give you a bit of a flavour for all this, um, we're going to kick off with our very, very first guest, um, my co-host, Mr. Tom May. <laughs> I this could be a car crash. It could, could work out all right. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I'll give myself uh, one. Yeah, there you go. I was half expecting uh, Justin to chime in and uh, and play with a toy. <laughs> you know. um, mate, you've, you've made this transition. Like you said, I, I actually, I think I picked up on a LinkedIn post today. It's exactly seven years since you retired um, from professional sport. So what's it been like, the transition from sport into business? uh a roller coaster i think um i think when i when i finished sport which which was um 7 years ago yesterday um i felt i was pretty well prepared for for transition i think a lot of other people in my team did um a lot of my teammates former teammates felt i'd done enough during my career to prepare myself properly for what was to come um I guess there's all sorts of aspects of the way you look at that. You look at it from a financial perspective. You know, are you set up financially um, set for life? There's not many people that can retire from sport and, and get their feet up and, and spend every day on a golf course. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a huge myth. That and, and, and all, they, they think that all professional athletes must be earning a fortune and that they don't need to work afterwards. But there's a very, very few who could retire on this, their professional sports um, salaries. And I think that's, that's you know, one of the things I think that, that allowed me to, to transition, I guess, fairly smoothly. Um, the one thing I would do differently, I would never go back and work for myself straight away, having finished um, professional sport. Um, I, I feel in in hindsight I could have done with a, safety net of working for someone 
uh, before going out and, and setting up my own business development consultancy with a, with a friend of mine. Um, that's a very difficult thing to do when you've been under the or within the bubble of professional sport for 20 years. Um, mm-hmm. had, I knew my paycheck was getting paid mostly uh, at the end of the month. And uh, I knew I was, I was you know, in, in a job for a period of time, whether it be one year, two year, three years. Um, but I think the difference between that and working for yourself, the stark contrast between the two, uh, was something that provided its own problems, uh, to add to the, to the, to the struggles that go with transition. Anyway, you lose your identity. You're not Tom May, the rugby player anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing to go through and no matter whether you're successful on the field, in the pool, wherever you're, wherever you're an athlete, um, you may well be successful a period of, you may be, well be successful straight out of sport you, or you may well be successful after a period of time out of the game. But there is no doubt that transitional period will have taken its toll on you both mentally and physically um, mm-hmm. during, I guess, an extended period of time. I think it probably took me three and a half, four years to stop the ship rocking really. Mm-hmm. Um and and it's a difficult thing that needs to be addressed because because more and more people are going to go through it. And I think as sports grow, the financial uh, uh, impact of um, of transition grows because people are getting paid more, and therefore the drop off is bigger when you finish. Um, that's going to cause some real problems moving forward, and, and and we need to make sure that we stay on top of it. Mm, absolutely. So when you were playing, I mean you. You have loads of challenges when you're playing. Uh, you learn lessons as you go along, and you do develop a performance mindset. I mean, what what were the challenges whilst you were playing? What did you learn about your mindset and how to develop a performance mindset from your life as a pro rugby player? Uh, listen, Simon, you, and you might you might disagree with me or agree with me. We worked together when when we were at Newcastle. Um, I wasn't the, the strongest. I wasn't the fastest. Um, I wasn't the most skillful, but up top, I was I was pretty well set that I would continue. I would I'd beat you. <laughs> yeah. um, I was I was a fairly competitive animal, and if you ask my five year old, she'd probably say exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, still winning, I'm leading. Um, so I think I think um, I think that's what set me me apart as a as a as a player. Hopefully, I'd like to be remembered as, as someone that that used my mental strength to get me through the game. I don't think, I don't know, it's a bit weird talking about it like this because I don't really like talking about myself. But the, I think looking back now, probably my mindset allowed me to, to have such a long career. I don't think you can have nearly 20 years in a professional game and, and be, be weak up top. Um, and generally when I set myself challenges, no matter how daft they, they may well be, I try and stick to them to the to the nth degree, sometimes to physical detriment of myself or you know, or to those around me, which which can be a bit of an issue. But um, you know, I've set some crazy challenges since I've since I've finished playing, um, including running around London in seven marathons, one back to back. And you'll know, even though you can't see it from this this screen, you'll know I'm not built for marathons, but I did it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think you're a sprinter. So, we'll call you a sprinter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't. So I'm not. I think that was that was the my strong point in, 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 in as a professional sportsman, mm-hmm. um, and I worked really hard to to try and improve. Um, and I think you know you don't often get professional sports people that that aren't don't have a slightly bigger ego than other people. Um, and don't have a, an internal drive or motivation to 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 keep pushing themselves and those around them. Mm. I think I mean, you're right about being able to stay at the top for an extended period of time, like you know, a, a decade, two decades um, in, in pro sport. You're going to get knocks. Not everything's going to work out your way. Most people get some serious injuries over that time. Life stuff happens. You know, you you're in form, you're out of form, you're selected, you're deselected. All of that goes on. 
Um, and, and I think, you know, many athletes do build up some really strong characteristics during that period. You know, they become more resilient people. They figure out how to achieve things that, you know, they've always aspired to. They develop this, you know, often massive work ethic because without it, you know, as you as you've said, talent really isn't enough not to keep you at the top for ages. Um, so they do develop loads of characteristics. I wonder whether you can. Well, there must be some athletes that have just made a, a pretty decent career out of being hugely talented, but not not that driven. Maybe it's maybe it's tough to find some. I don't know. Mm, I, I think they they appear on the radar very quickly sometimes, but whether they stay there is a completely different matter. Um, and, and not all, yeah. I think, have got the, the long-term hunger and drive to be successful. Um, and so when they've, they've made it, they're, they're bubble bursts, essentially. Um, and, uh, and they can disappear pretty quickly as well. The, when you transitioned into, into a business life, um, how much of that did you manage to take with you? What, what kind of did work when you took it out into business? Well, the first thing I learned was in business, everything's different. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, in, in a team sport, the bloke on the inside's got my shoulder, the bloke on the outside's got my back. Um, I learned pretty quickly that, that that wasn't the case in the corporate world. Mm. Um, through through uh, connections that I, I... I inherently trust people straight away as soon as I meet them. Now, that... I've learned over time that I need to build that trust now. Um, it's not like moving into, you know, if I, I left Newcastle and I went to Toulon and I went from trusting 30 blokes in the northeast of England to trusting 30 blokes in the th- southeast of France. Mm-hmm. Um, and not, not not one of them, you know, sort of broke that trust. Yeah. Um, I, it, it was pretty clear to me quickly in the corporate world that that's not the case, that there are other... Um, other drivers at play, uh, whether that be individual greed, individual um, perception, or, or or their own goals, or or, or whatever their their you know business is attempting to do. Um, yeah. There are different different forces at play pulling in different directions. Whereas whereas everything within sport is is generally pulling up and down the same plane. Yeah, uh, yeah. and if you're not, you're out the door. Mm. <laughs> So that I, that was quite an interesting experience, and, and as much as it hurt at the time, I was upset. It hit me financially. The, the, I learned more about that period of time about myself and and what I'd stepped into than than anyone could have told me, you know, at university or or anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, but but I think you need to go through those periods to to come out on top, and it's the same within sport, you know. There are times in sport where you're up, where you're down. It's the same in business, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's how you react to those different scenarios that, that that eventually means you either end up on top or at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, and I do think that's one of the massive sort of skill sets that athletes often bring out into their post athletic career. Um, that ability to sort of find a way, figure it out, um, not give up. You know, that sort of tenacity and the drive and the hunger. I think the essentially what you're talking about there is an entrepreneurial spirit, mm. um, and that's why I felt I was pretty well set up to to go out and and move into business on my own. That opened me up to different um, threats, I guess. Um, but you know, I'm I'm happy to to think quickly on my feet or, or, or try and be as flexible as possible. Um, you know, I don't. If if you set me a target, I'll do what I can to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's that's something that's that's. It's not just sports people that have that, mm. but but all of them will have it. Um, yeah. You know, there are other people that have those traits, but there one thing's guaranteed: ninety nine point nine percent of sports people are incredibly driven, and if you give them a target, they'll hunt that down. Yeah, yeah um, whatever whatever it means, the benefits are at the end of it. Yeah, I actually think you probably see that more in athletes who weren't naturally talented. You know, who encountered more of the bumps in yeah. the road, and more of the obstacles, and had to figure it out. You know, had to figure out how to get to the top because natural talent wasn't going to do the trick for them. Yeah, because well, you, you know that that actually <laughs> to play at the weekend, 
you need to you need to bend over backwards and make sure that you're you're doing what you can and more mm. to make sure that you're in the hot seat. Um, and that's a that's a brilliant trait, I think, to to bring into you know this second career that that sports people have. Mm. Um, there's not many people that retire at thirty or thirty six. Um, yeah. You know, my my son will say to me, oh, "You've retired once already. Why are you working?" You know, well. Yeah, there's a slight financial thing that goes on in life. We have to pay for stuff, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a different conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, have you seen how much you eat? Um, right, you know, yeah. I think it's. Um, I think it's. I think it's an interesting aspect of of individuals to look at. If you look at all, I, in fact, I spoke to someone who wrote um, wrote a book on on psychopaths. And he likens sports people to to psychopaths. They're on the mm-hmm. same. They're just a d- different end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's quite an interesting uh, concept to, to take on board, and perhaps a bit alarming. But you know, it's um, it's interesting nonetheless. Yeah, one of the uh, challenges I think sports people may have is the fact that actually sports teams and squads and everything else are quite institutionalized in in a sense. You know, there's a time to wake up and a time to arrive at training and a time to go home and a time to get on the bus and a time to get off the bus. And sometimes you just kind of get taken from training ground to hotel, to plane, to hotel, to training ground, to match, whatever. And and actually, you're kind of wrapped up in a nice little system that carries you through, which, of course, is not the same when you get out into the you know, sort of post-athletic world. Um, did you find that, that any, you know, that, that became a challenge or that there's anything that you just genuinely didn't feel prepared for? Yeah, like I woke up on day one, I was like, my God, what do I wear? <laughs> you know, like I was going into London, do I do I just wear what I want or do I, you know, wh- what do I do? Because I tried to get that. I don't like that. that, this, that and, and the pan, pandemic has proved this to me. I don't like, I don't like home feeling like a workplace. Mm. So I, even when I was, you know, I didn't have an office when I finished, finished playing. Um so I wanted to get out of the house. Now that, that meant I spent a huge amount of money in coffee shops or, you know, wherever it might be, but I was going to work. So, okay, well, what does that mean? I've got to wear and when do I have lunch? And cause all of these things, you're basically spoon fed. Um, mm. and maybe that was why I swung back the other way and went, well, I'm just going to go and do completely what I want to do. And no one can tell me any otherwise. Um, they've been telling me to do what what I had to do for in, near enough to what time I needed to go to bed for for twenty years, um, and and now was my time to do what I wanted. Now that's great, but there are also um, some some downsides to that that that, that have we, I've already touched on. Um, but certainly the flexibility, I think that especially modern day working life gives to to athletes as they make that transition will probably put them in a more comfortable position than than shifting directly into a nine to five where you're sat at your desk and you've got to hit you've got to be there for that amount of time um, because that as an athlete is absolutely terrifying. Yeah, 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 I, and I think it's it's often the same for people who come out of corporate and become entrepreneurs as well. You know, the fact that the structure was was taken away. Um, could, you, you said you were kind of seven years on now. Um, what are your big challenges now in business? Um, patience. Yeah. Probably. Um, mm. And I'm also, at times, alarmed at how long things take to get done in the corporate world. Mm. It, in a rugby context, you get, you get beaten on a Saturday you then have a short turnaround. You've got a game on Friday night. And it's worked backwards. Thursday's a team run. Wednesday's off. You'll probably be recovering on the Sunday. So you've got two days to fix your problems. Now, that might have been a big loss. And you might have all sorts of problems going on with injuries, personnel, tactics, whatever it might be. Um, and you've got two days to work it out. Mm. Uh, and then you have a further few days to talk about it and ensure that the plan is in place to make sure you take the pitch on a Friday night that that success is the ultimate outcome. 
people don't answer their emails for 10 days in the corporate mm-hmm. world. It's, and you might well say that I don't answer the emails to you in 10, 10 days. But... <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. um, I, I, I just think things can be things can be actioned so much faster in the corporate world and people don't realize how quickly they can get things done. Um, mm-hmm. It's just an intent to get things done at pace. And it, I don't think sport, allow, you, you have no, no matter what sport, you can chuck any sport at me and, and I'll say, don't have time to react. You don't have time to, to think about it and move on. You know, imagine if you get the yips playing golf. Mm. you've got four days to sort it out and then you're going to play another another potentially four rounds of golf or two rounds of golf before you don't make the cut and and what it, it, this could be on the biggest stage um you know do you embarrass yourself or do you is this all you focus on for the next two three days to make sure that actually take a bit of pain up front to make life a lot easier further down the line i think the pace pace of corporate life at time like i couldn't get my what happens to august and december december in the corporate world like mm. where does everyone go <laughs> well what happens the world stops um and i think i for, again coming from a from a sporting perspective august is your pre-season certainly in rugby or football one of those winter sports main main part of your season for cricket mm. then you come to christmas and it's one of the busiest times of the year you might be training on Christmas Day or you might be playing on Boxing Day. Um, whereas people just disappear into the ether and, and, it, it, and there's just voids in the corporate world which really test my patience. And I think that's one mm. of the things that I'm still struggling with a bit seven years in. Mm. Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, the, the focus, that kind of intense focus that sports teams have um, doesn't really appear in, in any other uh, kind of walk of life. Um, I, I suspect it probably does if you look at really extreme um, uh, operations like special forces and things like that, where you absolutely have to get this right. I like you say in sport, you're walking out in front yeah. of the, stadium, the fans, there's no hiding place. The TV cameras are there, there's no hiding place. Um, and, and, you know, it's the same if you look at really, really high level special forces or surgical teams or whatever. Um, but in corporate, there probably isn't that, that level of intensity around their performance. No, it's really interesting, I, and certainly something I've discussed before is actually that that comes at a sort of worker level within those corporate um, environments. If you go up into senior management level, some of these people are having to to really look after clients or colleagues or whatever it might be. They focus on what what I believe to be central to my physical performance in food, nutrition, sleep. It mm. goes out the window. Um, which having not been able to have a, have a beer for 20 years is actually quite interesting from time mm. to time. But, you know, it's, um, it's, it's quite, an, you know, a polar opposite approach to the way that, that, that performance is, is sought after. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think there, there is a really stark difference, actually, between the way people look after their own minds and bodies um, in different fields of endeavour. Um, the other thing that was uh, really interested in, you've been working with uh, athletes who have transitioned into the world of work for a while. What do you, uh, what kind of advice do you give them? What conversations do you have with them based on your own experience? The, the first thing I say to a, a, a large portion of them is this isn't going to be your next job for life. Mm. Because I think that's, you know, if you've come from a, a five-year career in cricket or a 10-year career in football, that's all you've known. Mm. And so my next career is going to be one, one thing. It's not. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, there'll be very few people that go from 30 to whenever you re- re- retire um, and stay in one place. Um, mm. it, and if you do, you'll be right at the top of the tree. Um, because I, that's one of the things I, I cert- certainly try and make people understand is that she's almost as important to know what you don't like as what you do like and given where you've come from you're not going to have had the opportunities to unless you've been really proactive and gone out and um you know uh, looked looked for ideal 
um, work experience opportunities, you're not going to know much about that or different roles. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think so. That's that's one of the things that that that, that I certainly try and get across. And you know, I've been involved in in various different things since my time playing. You know, I had I had a 19 year career of which 18 I was always doing something else. Mm-hmm. And the one year I didn't do something was the was the year I got dropped the most. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mind needed to be needed to be elsewhere. Rugby needed to be my outlet, even though it was my job. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I th- I think athletes that come out of sport there's a there's a there's a element of desperation because it's like you know shit where am I going to get the next paycheck from yeah if it's gone from having a month on month so until you get your next job no one's paying you mm-hmm. um, and when you do get that next job they're probably not paying you what you were pay- getting paid when you were when you were competing at what, whatever sport you were doing. Um, that understanding of reality, I think, is really important to get across because it sport distorts everything. Yeah, you've got rugby players that are earning five, six hundred grand a year. You go and get that in the corporate world, you're you're right up the C suite, mm. mm. um, and and you've you've been at your at your job at your specific role for a very long time, as they will have been in 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 sport yeah um but that that to some people is is quite frightening so mm-hmm. it's trying to it's trying to um allay those fears at the same time as demonstrating the opportunities that are there for for all sports people to take when they do finish yeah there's a, a couple of things that i've noticed with athletes that you know i've worked with who have transitioned across you, you mentioned identity being a big one um and that question of who the hell am I if I'm not the professional rugby player or, you know, the Olympic swimmer or whatever. Um, but alongside that, you've gone from being an absolute master at what you do, top of your game, to being an absolute novice in whatever you're moving into usually. Um, and, and I think that that can be a difficult challenge for a lot of people, you know, starting out as a, as a bare bones beginner again. Learning new skills, being embarrassed to not know something, um, maybe you aren't embarrassed. Maybe it's maybe that's a maybe that is a sporting trait. You you leave sport, and because you've known everything about your sport, you become embarrassed that you don't know something. Well, we we shouldn't be really. Mm. Um, I'd be one of those that fitted into that category. Oh, I, sh- I should know this. This is, an, this is yeah. terrible. I don't know it. Uh, but why should I know it? Why would I know it? They don't know what. The lineout calls are not that I did anyway, but you know, it, <laughs> you, you <laughs> far, they just jumped. Yeah, that lot just jumped and pushed as far as I was concerned. <laughs> um, so, but do, do you know what I mean? It's you know why why should sports people be bar- be embarrassed? I, that was one thing that bugged me a lot. People found it. I don't know whether they got a, some sort of kick out of it, but you know all these sort of I don't know. CEO is a bad example, but these sort of acronyms that, that they just chuck out uh, and, you know, clearly bamboozle it, corporate speak that actually is just complete drivel. Just speak normally. Um, you know, we, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, person to person. I think that's that was how I sort of got through periods of time where I was finding it really difficult. I just looked at someone, whoever I was with, and I was like, they're a normal person. I'm a normal person. If we get on, we'll probably be all right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how that's how I've tried to sort of make my way through scenarios. And some of them I've been caught out, some of them I haven't. Um, but you end up learning and, and allowing yourself the space to learn because people will try and catch you out. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's not a great thing for for them to be doing. But you know, it's. Um, there's certainly something I, I I mean I remember sitting in meetings like I've got no idea what they're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. It was just code. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it, sometimes a compounding factor with that is that lots of people expect, for example, an Olympic champion to be brilliant at whatever they do, automatically, immediately brilliant at it, um, and forget the fact that they had to learn their way to being an Olympic champion. That didn't happen overnight, and if they want to be great at something else, that's not going to happen overnight either. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a compounding factor in there. Um, brilliant. Now, uh, 
at the end of all of our podcasts, we're going to have a quick fire five questions, which normally you are going to be asking our guests. But because you are the guest, I'm going to be asking you. Um, you've got to memorize these because obviously this is going to be your job from now on. <laughs> um, so um, question one, and Justin wrote these. So if they're rubbish, you can blame him. Um, if you hadn't been a professional athlete, what, what would you have been is the first question. Uh, what other vocation took what you month? interest? Uh, well, my mum would say I was t telling her I was going to be a professional or I just wanted to play rugby from even before rugby was professional. So um, I'm not sure what else I've said. Probably maybe if, I don't know, like a, I think now maybe something like a PT. Mm. Uh, but back then I was probably thinking about a fireman or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, I, I heard Mark Cavendish. I'll have, to, I'll have to ask my mum. Yeah, yeah, we should bring her on the show actually. <laughs> Um, that could uh, be I bad. Heard, yeah, okay. Um, I heard Mark <laughs> give an answer on this one, and he said, if I wasn't a professional cyclist, I'd have been trying to become a professional cyclist. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe that's what I would have been, yeah. Um, so exactly. question two, question two is, uh, who is the person you admire most in sports and in business? I think uh, years ago it was Rob Andrew and then he became my boss at Newcastle. So I don't, I, it wasn't him anymore. Um, uh, I think now when I watch the TV, some of these golfers are ridiculous. Mm. I mean, I've now taken up golf um, and I've got a half decent handicap of 13 and a half. But, oh, oh Wow to be doing what they do with the mental torment that's going on in their brains yeah. is, is mind blowing. Um, so I don't know, someone like Tommy Fleetwood, I think is quite funny. Um, mm. He could be, he could be quite an amusing guy to have around a golf with, with regards to business. Um, I, I, do you know what? There's probably not one person, anyone that's been disruptive in, in changing a, a sector. I, I, you know, I love, learning about what, what how they've gone about building the business or what they've done to to um create their empire um mm. because and, and you know my current ceo talks about um uh anything that changes in business it comes from outside that that market mm. it comes from someone with a completely different perspective and i think that's a really interesting way to think about things um so yeah, anyone anyone that's really really changed changed their industry. Cool, brilliant. Uh, question three: You have some funds to make an alternative investment. Would it be crypto, artwork, classic car, property? What would you lose your? Well, money? the art the ass has fallen out of crypto, hasn't it? So let's not go there. <laughs> uh, artwork? Mm, no, uh, cl might be a classic car. I had an interesting couple of dealings with that when I was just when I was just out of sport. But that's another story. P probably my dad would force me into property. I would think. Fair play. Um, I'll go with that. Fair play. Question four: Are you a spender or a saver? Well, I'd like to think I'm a I'm a saver, but whenever I check at the end of the month, <laughs> there doesn't seem to be a huge amount to save. So maybe I'm a spender. Um, probably need probably to ask you that one, though. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We should just come through the door. I'll ask you in a minute. <laughs> um, last but not least on these, uh, you can only watch one more film for the rest of your life. Um, what do you watch? Four. Any given Sunday is pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I do Fair like flat, that one. Yeah. Yeah. I do like that one. Um, I watched Shawshank uh, Redemption last night. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, yeah. Quite long, though. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it re reminded me what a <laughs> looks like. Yeah, Fantastic, yeah. brilliant. Cool. Well, thank you very much, mate, for being our very first guest. Um, obviously, you'll be on the other side. I liked of the, being uh, guinea pig. Yeah, uh, on the other side of the fence with me next time. Um, well, that's all for today, folks. Um, hope you'll join us again for the next episode. We have got some amazing guests lined up, and we've got some fantastic prizes and uh, and giveaways as well as we go through the year. Um, stay tuned afterwards for the little 60 second wrap up after the credits and we will see you again soon. Take care.
As promised, here's my little 60 second wrap up. Firstly, talent might be enough to get you to the top, but it often doesn't keep you there. And actually, sometimes it's the athletes who didn't have the natural talent who ended up be developing transferable skills and characteristics that allow them to be successful in the rest of life. The fact that they weren't naturally talented means that they develop the resilience, they develop the work ethic and that competitive drive that enables them to be successful in business. Secondly, there are some disciplines from sport that could really be applied into business. And I think there's an opportunity that businesses often miss um, around developing fantastic teams where everybody genuinely has each other's back and really trusts each other. Using the intensity of a performance cycle, which in sport usually goes from week to week, um, which drives rapid improvement, performance improvements, and even just the ability to look after ourselves, uh, make sure we eat well, we sleep well, we're hydrated, we recover. All of those little disciplines are incredibly valuable in business. The third insight though, is that business and sport are different. The challenges are different and you can't necessarily apply principles from sport directly into business. It has to be within a context, applied within a context. So we need to figure out how to apply this stuff in business. I hope that's been really helpful. I really look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Podium Podcast. Take care.